We know that the great, the greatest commandment is to love God with all our hearts. Here it speaks about love in verse 9. To love God with all our hearts and to love our fellow believers like Christ loved us, vertical and horizontal, those are the greatest commandments. Every other commandment is a subsidiary of these two commandments. Every commandment. Like someone said, if you love God, you can do what you like. If you love God with all your heart, you can do what you like. You'll never do wrong. If you love your neighbor just as yourself, you can do whatever you like to him. You'll never do wrong to him. Because every commandment is basically spelling out these two commandments. But in the new covenant, we have an added advantage that the new old covenant people who also had these commandments did not have. And that is we have the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom in how to manifest our love. You know, there's a lot of love which is foolish. It's not divine love. In divine love, there's a divine love is characterized by wisdom. And that's why God allows certain things in our life which we can't understand. So he says here, I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. Now we never associate knowledge and discernment with love. We think love is just be good to people and be nice to them. But he says, I pray that your love will abound in real knowledge and discernment so that you may approve the things that are excellent. Because that's how you're going to be sincere and blameless in the day until the day of Christ. So that goes back to Moses' prayer. Teach us to uh, number our days that we may have a heart of wisdom. So that's what he's saying. He's com combining love with wisdom here. That you may approve the things that are excellent. You've heard the proverb, the good is the enemy of the best. Or the good is the enemy of the excellent. Um, you know that excellent is better than good. So you can do something good and miss what is excellent. Yeah. Have you ever gone and bought something in a store or a shop and come back home and somebody tells you, hey, there was something much better quality than what you bought for a slightly cheaper price in another place and say, wow, what a fool I was. What you got, got was good, but there was something excellent. It's like that in the Christian life. Sometimes we choose what is good and we can miss the excellent. And that's his, his prayer. He says, I pray your love will abound so that you can discern and what is excellent and choose that. And in the margin, if you've got a margin in your Bible, it says here in the margin of my Bible, that phrase in verse 10, so you may approve things are excellent, is also, it says in, in the original Greek, can also mean distinguish between the things that differ. That's a beautiful expression. To distinguish between the things that differ. You know, sometimes a off-white color can look like white to you till you put a real white paper next to it and say, hey, that's not really white. It's sort of off-white. I thought it was white. So it's like that. To distinguish between off-white and white. To distinguish between good and excellent. Sometimes the difference is very little. He says, I pray that your love will discern what is excellent and choose. In other words, that you'll have wisdom. It's not enough to have love, you know. I use the expression like, love is the petrol that fills your tank with a car or a scooter. But wisdom must be in the driver's seat. Yeah, our, our tank must be full of petrol. But if you don't have a driver who's driving that car, it's going to crash. Or you've got a foolish driver sitting at the wheel. It's going to crash. However much petrol you have in the tank. However much love you have. Do you know a lot of Foolish love that parents show to their children, for example. 
lot of us have wisdom as parents. You, you don't give everything that your children ask you for, do they? Do you? You love them. And when you love them, you don't give them everything they ask for. Sometimes you give them a painful injection and they, whine, they wonder why in the world does mommy hate me to get, give me, take me to a doctor and give me an injection. That's wisdom, to protect it from something. God is like that. There are a lot of things in God's ways with us which we can't understand. As we grow older and get, acquire more and more of God's wisdom, we begin to understand that God's love is not like human love. He allows us to go through difficult times financially. He allows us to go through sickness, to face things with, with various reasons. You know, there are things that are bad, things that are good, things that are excellent. In the Old Testament, they could only discern between good and evil, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And when a person has a conscience, he can discern between good and evil, but it requires the Holy Spirit to discern between good and excellent. That's another thing altogether. That's really the tree of life. The tree of knowledge of good and evil tell you this is good, this is bad. Okay, fine. If I go to the tree of life, that will tell me what is excellent above what is good. So we can say that's the different, that's the tree of good and excellent. And I can choose what is excellent. And that means the tree of life is the Holy Spirit. Are you making the choice of Adam? Satisfying yourself? I'm not doing anything wrong in my life. Well, that's not enough. Teach us to number our days so that one day at the end of our life we present your heart of wisdom. And that requires, a, like in Genesis 1, every day, a renewal. And the other thing is, is we, if we do that every day as we grow up, we'll have wisdom to help others who come to us, who ask us for counsel. The world is full of needy people. Who, you know, I remember reading in Jesus how he had such wisdom. Here was these women, the woman caught in adultery and the Pharisees wanted to stone her and Jesus knew the law because he himself gave it to Moses from heaven. A woman who commits adultery must be stoned to death. Jesus gave that law. The Pharisees didn't have to teach him about it. But now they were testing him. What, what's, he going, what's he going to do? He's got such a reputation for kindness, this man. Let's see what he's going to do now. Is he going to say disobey the law? And what wisdom there was. He said, yeah, keep the law. But he who is without sin, throw the first stone. And they all went away, beginning at the eldest, John chapter 8, till there was only one man left. Have you read that? There was one man left who had never sinned. And that was Jesus. He was qualified to throw the stone. That's the thing you've got to notice there. He who is without sin, throw the stone. And there was one man left there without sin. Who could throw the stone and obey the law and stone her to death? Why didn't he do it? Because God doesn't take any delight in stoning adulterous women. Not even, you know, sometimes some preachers can be so hard in the way they try to keep the law of God as they think they're standing up for righteousness. And I can, and I listen to them, I can sense, yeah, there's a lot of so-called righteousness, but it's human righteousness. It's a man's way of looking at it. There's, it lacks compassion. There's a lot of truth there, but there's no grace. We need truth, but we need grace as well. And Jesus said to her, if I were to paraphrase his words, I don't have any stones in my pocket and I'm not going to pick up any. I didn't come here to earth to stone people to death. I came here to save people from their sin. So I don't condemn you. Don't sin again. Adultery is serious. Don't do it again. Go. Let your life be changed. That's wisdom. To discern between what is good and what is excellent. To choose the highest. That's how it must be. And there, I, I saw examples like this, you know, where Jesus was always chose the highest. And some, he didn't have to give a big sermon, just one word. And uh, another time, shall we pay tax? Should we give to Caesar? And said, show me what's on that coin. Whose image is that? 
O Caesars, give to Caesar what is God's, uh, what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. And like someone has said, whose image is on that coin? Caesar's. Give that to Caesar. Whose image is on you? God's. Give to God what is God's. That's what he wants. So there was such wisdom in what he said, you know, in those little sentences, sometimes just one word. And then I read this verse. It's a promise, you know, a promise that we can claim. I read this promise in Luke chapter 21 and verse 15. I will give you utterance and wisdom which none of your enemies will be able to resist or refute. That was a great promise. That just like the Father gave Jesus wisdom, I believe when the Pharisees were saying, stone this woman to death, and it says Jesus was scribbling on the ground, he was just doodling like we sometimes do with a pencil or a pen, praying, Father, what shall I say? He lived on earth as a man, and he sought wisdom from the Father just like we have to. And we doodle and say, what shall I say, Father? Give me a word. Tell them, he who is without sin, cast the first stone. Okay. He who is without sin, cast the first stone. That's how Jesus lived. He lived by every word that proceeded from the mouth of the Father. That is wisdom. And I say, Lord, I want to live like that. I want to live by knowing what is the word that God has for me. I, I often see God like that when I stand in a pulpit. I say, Lord, I mean, I can take a Bible study on any subject when I get up in the pulpit because I've studied the Bible for years. But that may not be the exact word that this particular congregation needs at this particular time. For that I need to hear a word from you, a word of wisdom that will meet the specific need of somebody sitting there. And who can do that? Only you can do that, Lord. You know the hearts of people. That's the meaning of prophecy, to share something which is exactly according to the need of some particular people. And it doesn't have to be from a pulpit. It could be when somebody visits your home. Maybe some sister visits your home and you're sitting talking to her. And she may be in a need that she's too, she is too embarrassed to express. But if you seek God for wisdom instead of passing on the latest gossip, Say, Lord, give me some wisdom here. God may give you a word to say to her, maybe a verse of scripture. And she'll say, how did you know my need? You didn't, you didn't know it. You were just in touch with God, that's all. What a wonderful way if all of us begin to live like that. You can encourage your husband sometimes with just one word. Or your wives. We live in a world where it's surrounded with foolishness all around. I want to encourage you to go to the tree of excellent and good and choose the excellent. The Holy Spirit giving you wisdom, what to say and what not to say. So here is a promise. The Lord says, I'll give you wisdom. I say, Lord, I want it. I want to discern. See, Paul says in 1 Corinthians in chapter 2, 10, uh, sorry, 6, 1 Corinthians 6, now Paul had come to a place where he had overcome sin and uh, he says that sin shall not have dominion over you, Romans 6, 14, and when you play, come to a place where you overcome conscious sin, that means you're not knowingly doing anything wrong and if you slip up somewhere you immediately confess it keep your conscience clear, then you're living in conscious victory over conscious sin. I mean, there may be unconscious areas which we still don't know. But conscious areas, we're avoiding sin, and if we slip up, we immediately confess it, claim the cleansing of the blood of Christ, and we keep our conscience clear. He was living there. And therefore, he could say something like this, 1 Corinthians 6, 12, All things are lawful for me. Now, a carnal Corinthian could not say that. He couldn't say all things are lawful for you, carnal Corinthians. You, carnal Corinthians, 
are living in such a careless life that all things are not lawful for you. But for someone like me who's really taken sin seriously and overcome conscious sin, everything is lawful for me. But in spite of that, I don't choose all those things. All things are not profitable. So among the hundred lawful things, I choose the ten profitable things and do only that. That's why he accomplished so much in his life. There are a hundred good things you do, you can do. In a country like India, with so much of need, I can spend all my life helping all the beggars on the street. Yeah, if God calls somebody like Mother Teresa to do that, praise the Lord, I respect her for what she did. But I need to know what my calling is. It's a very good thing. But it may not be God's will for me. Jesus healed so many lepers and so many blind men. But he didn't start a colony for lepers. It was not his calling. He had only three and a half years of ministry and he had to concentrate that on not building up a colony for lepers and rehabilitating them and getting them in back into society. He could have done that. That would have been a very good work, but he'd have missed out on making disciples. There would be no church today. So you see, Jesus had to select between a good thing to do, establishing a colony for lepers, rehabilitating them, which a lot of people are doing today in the name of Christ, which is very good, and choosing what the Father had told him to do. That's why he could say at the end of his life, John 17, 4, I've glorified you on earth, Father, by finishing the work you gave me to do. Not doing a lot of good things, but finishing the work you gave me to do. That's what the Apostle Paul, he didn't go around establishing a colony for released slaves or, um, you know, lepers that are cleansed or any such thing. There's a lot of social needs in the first century. It must have been terrible. I mean, think of it, all the advancement in society, still what a lot of social needs there are today. Paul could have spent his time doing that. But he didn't do it. He knew that God had called him to plant churches, to make disciples. Now, I'm not saying everybody has to do that, but you need to know what your calling is. And so Paul said, if I choose some good thing, I can miss out the excellent. So there are many lawful things I could do, but I'll only choose what is profitable. So there's the unlawful, that of course we must never do. And then there's the lawful, and then there's the profitable. And that's the difference between a carnal Christian and a spiritual Christian. A carnal Christian never does anything unlawful, but does what is lawful. Now you think the carnal Christian is the one who does unlawful things. The un person who does unlawful things is an unbeliever. He's not even a believer. If you're doing unlawful things, I'd say you better check out whether you're born again. But if you are born again, and you say, well, I'm not doing anything wrong, brother, you could still be very carnal, even though your Bible knowledge is so much, and you think you know so much, and you think you're a wonderful brother in the church, but if you live at the level of, I'm not doing anything wrong. Like, you know, in question-answer time, we have a lot of question-answer sessions in different conferences, and one of the frequent questions we get is, is this wrong, brother? Is that wrong? And I tell them, listen, this is like children on a railway platform saying, Daddy, how close can I stand to the edge of the platform when the train's coming by? Six inches, three inches, and these children have a competition. Who can stand closer to the edge of the platform when the train's coming by? I said, you stand a few feet away, completely far away from others. That's wisdom. But this type of question, how close can I, as a Christian, can I get right up to there to the edge of the cliff and not do that? Paul said, I'm not living at that level. I'm not a baby trying to see how close I can go to the edge of a cliff. I want to stay far away from it. I want to choose what is profitable. I want to discern what is excellent. I'm not satisfied with doing good in my life. I want to do what is excellent. That's why he became such a spiritual man. That's why he was so useful to God. And I believe God wants all of us to be useful to him. I want to encourage you to discern the things that are excellent. Particularly in our speech. Think of a verse like this. Just one verse. There are hundreds of commandments. Think of one commandment, Colossians 4, 6. I'm sure you've all read it. Anybody who's read Colossians have read this verse. But I don't know how many of you have taken it seriously because most of us don't read the Bible slowly like I've encouraged you to read it. Think of this one verse. 
Colossians 4 verse 6. Slowly, let your speech always, and the important word there is always, be with grace. Let your speech be always with grace. When you speak to your wife, to your husband, to your children, to your neighbor, to the auto rickshaw man who is yelling at you and arguing with you about the fare, or, or your neighbor who is upset with you, or somebody who has come for a fight, or your relative who has cheated you of something, let your speech always be with grace. Because you're a child of God. That person is not. Or even if he is a child of God, he's living at the lower level of what is lawful, but you're living at the higher level of what is profitable. He's eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You're choosing the tree of what is excellent and good. You're living at a higher level. You're discerning between what is wise here, not what is right. This is my right. That's what they say in courts. Like the man who told Jesus, tell my brother to divide the property with me. I'm not asking for more than 50%. A dad has died and both of us are entitled to 50%. I'm not asking for 60%. Tell him to give me 50%. Jesus, you've got to go to court for that. Don't come to me. You came to the wrong person. If you come to Jesus, he'll teach you what is excellent. Forgive him. If he wants to steal it, let him take it. Can you take that position? Your brother wants to steal the family property. You're not going to take him to court. That's the spirit of Christ. Don't go to Jesus and Lord help me to win this court case because he will tell you the same thing which he told that man who made me a judge over you. Let him have it. God will give you what you need, brother. God will... Can God... Can You mean God is not powerful enough to give you what you should get? He can kill him and give you all the property. I'm, I'm not saying you should pray for that. But... <laughs> <laughs> but Maybe if that half may that half may amount to such a lot that uh, <laughs> it may ruin you if you get such a lot of money. And God wants to save you from destroying yourself, so He won't let you get your half. Praise God. He says, "If I get my rightful share of the property, I'll be so rich that it'll, I'll be ruined." Oh God, how thankful I am that my brother cheated me, that I got only ten percent of it, so that my life is saved. I can have a heart of wisdom instead of being ruined by money. Remember this, God controls everything. So let your speech be always with grace, as it were seasoned with salt. I think we all like salt in our food. And you can put a little bit of food in your, any food, as soon as it comes to your tongue, you know whether it's got salt or not. You see, yeah, you need a little salt there. It's like that, brothers, sisters, when you're going to say something, if you just test it out, you know Allah, how good mothers will taste a little spoon of the food they're cooking and say, hey, that needs a little more salt. The same way when we speak, before we speak, uh, put your mind into gear and check and your heart and say, is that wise? Is that the wisest way to say it? Not, is it right? That's the law, language of the court. But is it wise? Is it Christ-like? Many years ago, the Lord gave me this verse as a help to me. And I've tried to follow it. I've slipped up now and then and repented of it. But I've tried my best and it's helped me a lot. Psalm 12. See, there are two chapters on the tongue. One is James 3 and the other is Psalm 12. Please remember it. The use of the tongue. Psalm 12 and James 3. They're great chapters. Psalm 12 is the James 3 of the Old Testament. It's very interesting how it starts. Lord, godly men are not to be found. Faithful disappear from among the sons of men. Why? Because look at the way they use their tongues. They tell lies. They flatter. And they speak with a double heart. They flatter. They speak proud things and they are arrogant things. It's all about the tongue. Is that how godly people disappear on the earth? That's how godly dis people disappear. When people don't know how to use their tongue. That's the whole, the heading of the chapter is godly people are disappearing. And you say, how is that David? Well, the Spirit of God tells me to say, 
these fellows are not using their tongue properly. That's how we know that they are no God, they are not God. And then he says, in contrast, think of the words of the Lord. These are, this is wisdom. The words of the Lord are pure words like silver put into a furnace and refined seven times. That's the word the Lord gave me. When you're thinking of saying or writing something hard, throw it back into the furnace. Once, throw it back again. Once more, throw it back again into your mind. Think about it. Rewrite that letter. <clears throat> You've rewritten it. Rewrite it again. Go through it again. Because this is not just a greeting or something. This is a pretty stiff letter. And I often have to do that as an elder responsible for a number of churches. Sometimes I have to give advice to different people or deal with different problem situations with elders or others. I have had to throw that letter back, rewrite it, rewrite it, rewrite it, rewrite it, much more than seven times sometimes before I send it out. Good advice before you speak. Put it back in your mind. Is that the best way to say it? Do I need to say it right now? Isn't there a better time to say it? You know, if your married partner is angry, that's not the time to give a loving exhortation, please. No farmer sows the seed when there is a storm. Understood? What will happen to the seed? <laughs> you won't find it. It won't accomplish anything. When there's a storm, every sensible farmer says, oh, there's a storm, let me wait. And when the storm comes, it'll calm down. Every storm calms down in the world and in your home. Haven't you seen that? And when it is calm, then sow the seed. But it must be wisdom. Think about it. Do I need to say it? Is that the best way to say it? Your command, Lord, is that I will always speak with grace. Grace and truth. <clears throat> Truth is necessary. The Bible says, another way to, it says in Ephesians 4, you know that verse, speak the truth in love. Ephesians 4 and verse 15, I think. Speak the truth in love. Because that way we can grow up to the head, even Christ. So there's truth and love. I must not only speak the truth, I must speak in love. I must not only speak in love, I must speak the truth. It's the balance. And that can be compared to the bones and the flesh in our body. Mm. The bones are like truth. And the soft flesh on top of the bones is like grace. Which is more important? Bones or flesh? Bones? Okay, supposing you saw one day a skeleton walking up to you at night. <laughs> Would you say, hey, great, great to meet you. <laughs> You'd run the other way. The Pharisees were like that. They had all truth, 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 truth. Stone her to death. I'm not saying we have more than 200 bones in our body. We need every one of them. Jesus had all the truth that the Pharisees had. But the bones were covered with grace. That was the difference. So our truth must be spoken in love. At the same time, if you only have flesh, I'll be like jellyfish. You know, jellyfish have no bones. I won't be able to stand here. And there are a lot of evangelifish in the, in the evangelical world. <laughs> they don't stand for truth. I mean, you've heard me preach in this pulpit more than 30 years and you know that I stand for the truth. But we have to learn to stand for the truth with wisdom. And that's so important. I want you to pray what Paul says, Lord, give me wisdom. Let me end my life with a heart of wisdom. And all the trials of life, the difficulties in your home, the things you can't understand. Bow before God and read the word of God. And I want to tell you, if you don't read this book, you will never get wisdom. There's only one person in the universe whose wisdom is perfect. That's God. And if he's written only one book for man to read, you better read it. 
I mean, think of these people who want to make money. They would certainly read a book by the top uh, financial investment man in the world. Definitely they'd read it. Think if there's one book written by the top wisdom person in the universe. I'm surprised that so many Christians don't read the Bible regularly. I've been reading it for 54 years and I still read it and I discover things in it now. I'm surprised that so many people don't read it. And you'll never read it, brother, until you have the habit of reading regularly. So, if you're really eager to be able to use Scripture to bless others, read the Bible. Carry a Bible with you whenever you go to a meeting. That's how we get wisdom and allow the Holy Spirit to apply this to your life. And as you apply God's truth to your life and obey Him, wisdom will become more and more and you will get a reputation as a wise person. That's a tragedy. I'll say this in closing. You know, there's a gift called the gift of wisdom. It's mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12. It's one of the gifts of the Spirit. Is, but that's just a, a, a word of wisdom in 1 Corinthians 12. A word of wisdom means in a particular problem situation, God gave you the answer to that. That is a word of wisdom. And the Bible says the Corinthians had all the gifts. You know, it says that in uh, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 7, you're not lacking in any gift. So they had the word of wisdom. In some problem situation, they would have the word to speak to somebody. But we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, isn't there one wise man among you? Isn't there even one wise man? 1 Corinthians 6 verse 5. In spite of these fellows who had words of wisdom and occasionally saying something wise, there was not one wise man in that whole church. Because they didn't apply their hearts to wisdom in all of life situations. They were happy that once in a while they gave a wonderful word in the meeting which blessed somebody. That's not enough, brother, sister. We must be men and women of wisdom. And that comes through the daily grind of being faithful in temptation, in the secret life, being faithful in our thoughts and being faithful with our words and nobody listens to us. Faithful in our office where there are no believers listening to us. Faithful in the trains and buses and on the roads where there's a lot of road rage. But you are calm and peaceful. You acquire wisdom. Thank God for all these, what I call, call the schools and universities of wisdom God gives us around us. Our children, when they try our patience, we can get wisdom. May God help us. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, life is so short. So short. Help us not to waste our days in foolishness. At least of the days that are left to us. Help us to be wise, we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen.